Good evening or good morning or good afternoon. Uh, I'm Ingrid Srinath and I'm director of the Center for Social, in Social Impact and Philanthropy. And for those of you who don't know CSIP, we are India's first and so far only academic center focused on these topics. Um, we're part of Ashoka University, which as you, many of you will know, is India's pioneering private nonprofit liberal arts university. And our purpose at CSIP is to strengthen the ecosystem for philanthropy and civil society through building knowledge, norms, networks, and narratives. And we are absolutely delighted to have the opportunity to host this track that's called Disrupting Philanthropy, and very deeply grateful to Nudge for providing this critically needed platform. It, you don't need me to tell you that the philanthropic response to India's COVID crisis has been nothing short of phenomenal. As the pandemic and our responses to it unfolded, um, it revealed the woeful inadequacies of our systems of public health and social protection. And it was philanthropy from foundations, businesses, and those citizens that we too often refer to as ordinary uh, that came to our rescue. But even as this surge in giving took place, it became clear that not all giving was equal. Nonprofits whose funders had provided them flexibility in how those resources were to be used, those who could count on long term commitments from their donors, and those with stable funding that covered their core institutional costs were much better able to rapidly respond to the changing needs of the communities that they serve. They were able to swiftly adapt to operating online, both in their own operations and in their programs. In fact, many were able to extend the reach of their services to include new groups and new services. And they were better able to assure the safety and well being of their teams. I was horrified yesterday to learn that there was a large nonprofit, a 150 crore turnover nonprofit, that could not find 25 lakhs in flexible funding to allow them to move their operations online. That's how dire the situation can was, even for some of India's largest and best known nonprofits. Nor, of course, were all causes equally served by funders. I mean, despite all the data that we've seen that showed spikes in violence against women and girls, increases in child labor, child marriage, and the systematic exclusion of many marginalized communities, donors in the main have focused on the causes that dominated the headlines, in particular, the plight of migrant labor and the lack of oxygen. Perhaps they were hindered by the congenital lack of reliable data on philanthropy and the nonprofit sector in India. Who funds what and where? Which nonprofits serve which domain? Where can I find out about this geography and who works there or on this issue. Um, donors and nonprofits, you will, those of you who were in the thick of it will recall at the beginning of this crisis, literally was scrambling to identify partners, to figure out where they could best uh, address the, the problem. Um, it's not surprising then that many would choose to stay with the familiar 
uh, or access those that they already have relationships with. Um, in the midst of the pandemic, even as nonprofits were reeling from the surging demand for their services and struggling with the devastation that they were witnessing in their communities, combined with their own losses of family members and colleagues, they were hit, as you know, by a barrage of new regulatory requirements that sent them scrambling to open new bank accounts, get affidavits signed, try to figure out how they would cope with the loss of funding if they had previously received FCRA subgrants, how they would deliver outcomes if they had previously done so in partnership with grantees, and while donors overseas, NGOs in India, UN bodies, and the media all raised their voices to try and remedy this situation, Indian philanthropy, sadly, was largely silent. Another area of concern is that philanthropy in India, unlike in many other countries, has remained through this crisis relatively unmoved by the deep structural inequities that COVID has forced us to notice. Before the images that are seared into our brains of the last 15 months fade completely from public memory, I think we have a narrow window of opportunity to make radical change in areas as diverse as public health, education, labor rights, gender equity, and social protection. Likewise, with our response to the climate crisis, which was so starkly uh, presented to us in this week's IPCC report, Meanwhile, beyond these issues, civil society itself in India, together with the values and the institutions that underpin our democracy continue to be, continues to be under siege. A question for philanthropy that, that philanthropy will need to think about is, will it continue to largely be a spectator to these unfolding existential crises, or will it seize the moment to achieve the big systemic changes that are within our grasp? A few Indian philanthropists have in recent times started to what you might call move upstream to fund capacity building, technology, organization development, and some even further to build the ecosystem of data, of knowledge, of consulting, of academics, of evaluation, of networks and platforms. But the vast majority of funders in India limit their support to funding program delivery. And this, of course, is exacerbated by the legal frameworks that govern civil society, especially the law relating to CSR. Finally, in many countries around the world, philanthropy has been challenged in recent years to examine itself more closely, uh, from the diversity of their boards and staff, to the way endowments are invested, to the composition of grant-making portfolios and who gets to make those choices, and the explicit and implicit biases in grant making norms and systems. Another question then for Indian philanthropy, is Indian philanthropy ready yet to turn a critical lens on itself or will it wait to be challenged from the outside? The previous two sessions in this track have highlighted the new philanthropy that COVID has galvanized and the issues and regions that continue to be underserved. This session will focus on the how rather than the what of philanthropy and ask the question, what will it take to disrupt entrenched norms that prevent philanthropy from achieving its full potential? We're very fortunate in the speakers that are gathered here today. Each of them has studied philanthropy deeply. Uh, Arif Ikram is manager of Global Philanth Partnerships at Candid. His focus is on data collection, data sharing, and data literacy, as well as promoting accountability and transparency in philanthropy, and on building partnerships for collaboration across the field. One such partnership between Candid and CSIP has just created a new online portal that captures all the available data on philanthropy to and in India, a boon actually for philanthropists, nonprofits, researchers, and academics alike. In fact, it was supported by the Ford Foundation uh, from where Pradeep Nair, the next of our speakers, comes from. Pradeep is the regional head of the Ford Foundation. He's responsible for India, Sri Lanka, and Nepal. Ford, as many of you know, was one of the earliest international funders to focus on India. They've been here for over six decades, and they're known globally for their focus on social justice and inequality. 
they're also one of the earliest funders to focus on institutional bu institution building and they've led the charge on improving philanthropic norms in the USA and around the world. Phil Buchanan is, I've just been joking with him, is the sort of celebrity on our, on our panel. He's president of the Center for e Effective Philanthropy. He's a passionate advocate for the importance of philanthropy and the nonprofit sector, focusing in particular on helping donors to maximize their impact. His book, this one, Giving Down Right, Effective Philanthropy and Making Every Dollar Count is a must read if you work in philanthropy or with philanthropists. If you're a nonprofit, you might be well served by gifting all your donors a copy. And finally, uh, Pritha Venkatachalam is a partner at Bridgespan's Mumbai office. Pritha has advised governments, donors, foundations, multilateral organizations, nonprofits, and the private sector on a very wide range of development challenges. So welcome all. I'm gonna start with you, Pritha. Uh, Bridgespan uh, has of course been very closely engaged with what's happening on the ground with nonprofits and philanthropy through this pandemic. But you've also been working on this initiative that looks at how and why funders need to support all of the costs that it takes to achieve impact. So what can you tell us about that? Thanks so much, Ingrid. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be here. I especially like the provocative title of our session to be disruptive. And I'm going to use that as the cue to really request all funders in this audience and beyond to reframe the funding conversations that you have with your nonprofit partners to hopefully going forward, pay what it takes. And I'd love to tell you a little bit more about what this is. And the logos that you see on this website are the collective of partners who are coming together to really push this initiative in India. It's not a new concept by any stretch. It's been you know, on for decades, uh, started in the United States to really push the funding envelope to go beyond programmatic funding to total cost funding. And we launched it at the height of the pandemic in India in partnership with the five foundations uh, that are on the opening slide here. A.T. Chandra Foundation, the Children's Investment Fund Foundation, Edelgive, Ford and Omidyar Network India. And together we are trying to really show the evidence and hopefully change mindsets of funders to contribute not just to programmatic funding, but to overall organizational strengths of nonprofit partners. And over the next few minutes, I'll take you through some of the insights we got from the seven to eight months of research we undertook over the 2020 and early 2021 period. So as I mentioned, this is really intended to be a multi-year collaborative initiative. Uh, we are really just catalysts or enablers in this process. And even in the last one year of the initiative, Pradeep is here and hopefully he'll speak more because Ford Foundation has been at the forefront of this effort, not just in India, but also globally. Uh, in addition to the five funder partners, uh, over 400 NGOs participated very actively in this initiative to share their costs, both direct and indirect costs, as well as some of their challenges in OD before the pandemic and during the pandemic. And also intermediaries, CSIP, of course, in Ingrid's been a great champion of this, uh, and other intermediaries besides Britspan, like Dasra, Samhita, Sattva, uh, CAP, have all been actively supporting this. And I wouldn't be uh, doing justice if I don't mention GuideStar, uh, which, you know, through the candid partnership as well, has helped us a lot on the data side of the nonprofits, because as Ingrid hinted, lack of data has been a big issue in terms of funders even knowing what's the actual total cost of nonprofits. The focus for us in year one was to really assess financial health and resilience. We had a lot of anecdotal evidence in India about funders only supporting programs and out of every $10 that goes into the sector, potentially seven or $8 going to feed a child or immunize a child or educate a child and hardly two to $3 going towards everything other than that. But we wanted to really get ground up evidence and we did a survey of uh, multiple NGOs, but we got about 388 uh, reliable responses that we have used to share some of the insights today. We also looked at the impact on OD because what everybody told us was that 
yes, organizational development helps, but where is the evidence or what's the return on investment? So we did a detailed financial analysis of about 40 NGOs going through their PL and balance sheets to see whether they invest in organizational development and what might be some indicative impact of that investment. And then through 100 plus interviews of NGOs, funders, experts, we also studied funding practices and policies in the country across CSR, bilateral, multilateral, foreign and domestic funders and help develop a solution blueprint that is bespoke for India. So this is probably again, nothing new, but what is probably not as data-based is to show what is the indirect cost rate for the NGO sector in India. And through looking at the 40 NGO balance sheets PNL in great detail, you will notice that the bar graph here really stretches across the spectrum, starting with NGOs which have barely 5% of indirect cost right up to 51%. So similar to the corporate sector where you cannot have one SGNA sales, general administration costs for say an FMCG, financial service uh, industry or IT sector. Similarly, an NGO's operating archetype, its organization, its mission and communities and populations. And of course, the context it works under really underpins the indirect cost. And we found that even across these organizations, the average worked out to about between 19 to 20%. And in each of these buckets of within direct service and advocacy research NGOs, you'll notice that there's a real spectrum of indirect costs. So why really as a country are we specifying whether it's through FCRA or CSR policies to say that no more than X percent should go towards indirect costs? Because in effect, you're expecting that other funders are going to cross subsidize your investment in that nonprofit. So every dollar that any funder does not give towards the total cost that the NGO needs for its impact, you're expecting either the NGO to use other funding to go towards it, or for other funders who actually believe in true cost to cross subsidize your philanthropic support. So I think this is a very strong message that we would really like to take to the sector at large. We also found that about 70% of the NGOs, and of course the sample size is small, but what was startling is that these 40 NGOs we analyzed were being supported by some of the biggest funders in the country, both CSR, foreign and other domestic funders. So if this subset of 40 NGOs said that 70% of them faced a gap between their actual indirect costs and the amount they could raise through their grants, then we can well imagine the rest of the sector in the country. And we found that in this sample size, uh, there was a shortfall of over 10%. Some reported about 13 to 15%, others about eight to 9%, but significant percentage differences in terms of their actual costs and what they could fundraise for. Moving on to financial resilience, we found that about 54% of nonprofits, and you will notice the date here to be September 2020, so just at the end of the first wave of the pandemic in India, over half of the NGOs here had less than three months operating reserves. And here the sample size was a 388 NGOs, so a very large sample size. And this number was about 35% plus pre-pandemic. So even within the first six months of the pandemic, uh, at least another 18-19% of NGOs were pushed to have very limited operating reserves. And about half of them had not even once in the last three years had any surplus. So you can well imagine that at times of crisis like this, if one or two funders pull out, then that NGO story for impact is over. And it's not just the staff that works at the NGOs, but imagine the populations in rural or urban poor communities that they are serving who overnight would have to figure out other means of attaining those services or supports that that NGO provided. We found that this financial stress was far more accentuated when the NGO leaders belong to Dalit, Bahujan or Adivasis, or what in India are called the scheduled caste, scheduled tribe communities. And this was sobering. Because we are in the midst of, you know, the anti-black movement, you know, there's so much being talked about structural racism and structural discrimination across the world today. And there was very little data in India to show that caste was yet another dimension where NGO leaders who came from the Dalit, Bahujan, Adivasi communities were facing higher financial distress. 
So you will notice that 70% of such DBA-led NGOs did not have an operating surplus in the last three years compared to about 54% of other non-DBA-led NGOs. What was also stark was that 60% of such NGOs, again, worse off than the general NGO population, had less than three months of reserves during the pandemic. Of course, this is just the tip of the iceberg, and we are hoping that in this multi-year initiative, we will go deeper into researching these inequities and coming up with what course corrections are required. The other startling revelation in terms of inequity, which again was known through intuition, but data showed that both non-metro and rural NGOs, again, were struggling far more than the average NGO in India, again, both in financial resilience as well as getting operating surpluses in the recent years. And given that we looked at a three-year sample, this was predating the pandemic, not just as a result of COVID. And again, the percentages here are upwards of 60 65% of the non-metro rural NGOs. So clearly, unless the NGO had visibility and presence in some of the funder-located cities, they were struggling to raise money for their overall resilience and putting funds aside for a rainy day. So funders really need to disrupt the way they think to increase outreach to some of these NGOs that are facing such large inequities on caste, location, and other multiple identities. In terms of what do you get if you invest in OD, and here data is really hard because it's not possible to show that your return on investment is X percent. But with that caveat, we did some directional analysis of the CAGR of annual expenditure over five years of about 20 nonprofits that were willing to share this data on our study. And we found that NGOs that invested in organizational development had a 2x growth in their annual expenditure over a five-year period. And those that invested in OD programs who strategize saying, we want to invest in building our strategic planning, leadership, HR, finance, or technology, such capabilities, were growing much faster, both in terms of their budgets, as well as the outputs towards their mission, rather than those that were just being opportunistic or scrambling to get some funds to invest in HR, technology, et cetera. So again, a very powerful, although directional finding that if an NGO invested beyond programs to strengthen their organizational capacities, they actually grew better and more resilient towards achieving their overall mission. But sadly, despite that data, majority of the NGOs could not achieve this full potential. About 18% of them only said that they could invest adequately in OD. About 88% said that they were struggling to make both time and resources to raise funds for OD. And this was, again, very stark because most often the CEO was the CFO, the HR head, the fundraising head, and they were very stretched for resources to be able to focus on OD or fundraise for that. So a lot of fundraising opportunities missed because this was not a focus area for the nonprofit or their funders. And again, why are NGOs in India subscale? We do not have a single BRAC-sized NGO in India. I mean, Bangladesh, with its smaller population, has NGOs that are at scale by global standards. India has such a large NGO sector, such a thriving civil society, but we literally can count on our fingers, you know, how many of them are at scale by global standards. And when I mean scale, it's not necessary that you need to reach the whole country, but scale in terms of just having the team size, the resources, and support to reach your own mission as defined by that NGO leader. And again, you will see the blue bars here being all upwards of 70%, where NGO leaders in our survey said they were struggling to raise OD for leadership positions, unrestricted core funds, and just overall to invest across their organizational capacities. So what does this lead us to as a collaborative working on pay what it takes? And we're really hoping that over the next two to three years, more funders, more NGOs really join this movement because this is not intended to be an exclusive study, but more a field building movement where through data, through better practices, we want to move from improving awareness to over the next few years, changing mindsets and practices. And we came up with about four areas where funders could actually disrupt the way that the sector is working towards impact. The first one towards multi-year funder NGO partnerships, 
So let's no longer look at this as a principal agent problem, but everybody bringing certain important skills to the table and needing a long term partnership where the NGO at the end of every year doesn't have to struggle about who's going to fund my next year's cause. And let's go towards closing the indirect cost funding gap. We just saw data that showed again that all NGOs, but particularly those led by DBA leaders, non-metro rural NGOs, were struggling a lot more to close the indirect cost gap. So can funders really focus on providing more support to all of these NGOs? Third, to invest in OD, both in terms of finances, but also non-financial support. Uh, it was somewhat ironic that when we asked NGO leaders, they said that many of them improved their leadership through sending them for conferences and seminars. And I'm sure everyone who's attending this session knows how little that can contribute towards building leadership and a second line of bench that provides the next generation leadership to the founders of NGOs. So to invest in leadership, we really need much more rigorous uh, financial on and non-financial supports from funders. So that's the real third call to action. And finally, of course, helping NGOs build financial reserves, especially where they don't have operating surpluses. So I would urge funders as part of your due diligence for NGOs to not just get data on the credibility of the NGOs, the population reach and impact, but also on what's their reserve situation. Do they have funds to cover six months, one year of course, should there be a problem? If not, then I would really urge funders, unless there's a regulatory restriction, to support this as well. So I will stop here, but it, this is a real call to action. And I hope over the next few minutes, uh, we would have an enriching discussion from all of the other uh, eminent people on this panel about practices to disrupt philanthropy. Thanks, and back to you, Ingrid. Thank you, Pritha. Um, as you know, uh, the a study we've just we, we did recently uh, on the impact of COVID on nonprofits showed that uh, about 10% of NGOs in India of any size uh, had reserves that would last uh, longer than 12 months. Um, and so, and 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 this study was done before the second wave. So uh, we know the situation is likely to be even more dire uh, now. Uh, I'm going to turn now to Arif. Arif, uh, you're the data guy here. Uh, <laughs> one of the one of the things non uh, philanthropists say is that the reason they're not funding in remote areas, in you know uh, fringe causes or causes that are underserved, is because they they can't look. You know, how do they discover these organizations? Uh, and, and similarly, uh, nonprofits uh, that work in these areas are. The, the one question we get asked most often is, how do I gain access to the funders who might be interested in, in my domain? Um, can you sort of tell us, you know, how the data can help? Yeah, th thank you, Ingrid. Um, and good morning to everybody from New York. Uh, as Ingrid said, I'm Marif Ekram, Manager of Global Partnerships at Candid, and I'm really honored to be part of this uh, distinguished panel today. Um, so what Ingrid asked is a you know, very complicated, <laughs> complicated question. So it has no single answer and it will take us probably days and days of conversations to get to the bottom of it. And we definitely don't have days and days. We are going to be talking about this topic probably the next 10 minutes. So I will try to, you know, touch the surface and answer as many questions as possible. Um, and then look forward to having a lively conversation with you all. Um, so what I'm gonna say is probably sound like, you know, is for many of you is like preaching to the choir because you already know the stuff that I'm gonna say, but it's still, uh, I'm gonna, let's talk about it because preaching to the choir actually arms the choir with arguments and elevates the choir's discourse. So please bear with me. Um, so I thought today for our discussion today, uh, it would be interesting to go back and listen to the story that why Foundation Center, which is now Candid, so like our organization used to be called Foundation Center uh, before the merger with GuideStar. So why the, you know, why Foundation Center was created? The answer is McCarthyism. So what is McCarthyism? And some of you already know about this. 
but let me just take you through it real quick. So the gentleman that you can see on the screen holding, holding those papers, uh, he is a senator from Wisconsin, Joseph McCarthy, some of say very infamous <laughs> senator uh, from uh, Wisconsin. And uh, during 1950s, and he was a very powerful guy. And during 1950s, during the time of Cold War, he was sniffing and seeing communism and Russian spies everywhere. And no sector was um, beyond any doubt, including, you know, philanthropic sector. And he dragged all these people from all these different sectors um, to his hearings and subpoenaing this person, putting somebody in jail. So it was real, real scary stuff at the time. And he dragged, you know, philanthropic sector, you know, under his net. And he asked questions like, do you know of any foundations which have deliberately tended to foster communism or to weaken what is what we like to call Americanism? Ironic, I know so to some of you this might even sound familiar in your own context. But yeah, so we had that moment in, in, in 1950s. Um, so, in, so in one of these hearings, um, this guy, our friend, Russell Luffingwell, was brought to that Senate hearing. And in many hours of conversations at one point, he said, like, we think that the foundations, foundations should have glass pockets. And that is where actually out of that, you know, hearings, you know, the actual transparency movement in the US for foundations began. They all recognize that there is this need for the sector to be more transparent because out of without transparency, then there will be always these suspicions, um, you know, uncalled for, undue suspicions that, you know, um, came out of those McCarthyism era. So uh, all the big foundations, um, including Carnegie and um, you know Russell Leffingwell, he later became a founding member of Foundation Center. At, and they all came together. They uh, built this organization called Foundation Center. And the only job of Foundation Center at that time was to ensure transparency of all this. At this time, at that time, there was like 1,000 foundations to ensure transparency of all these thousand foundations in the U.S. So definitely in 1950s, 1960s, the technology wasn't where we are now. So they would publish all these, you know, very uh, thick directories of foundations that will cover, um, like, what they're funding, where the funding is going, who are the uh, members, board members, employees, and all that. And then over time came these these 990s, and yes, this is an actual 990 from back in 2003, if I'm not wrong. Uh, thankfully, it doesn't look like that anymore, and it can be mission readable. Um, so came this 990s, which is basically how uh, the foundations and nonprofits in the U.S. Uh, make themselves transparent. It's um, an instrument through which the complexity and diversity of all these foundations is actually manifested. It's a legal requirement. Um, the law, you know, it went through some revisions, but then what we have now is basically the a foundation uh, to ensure the transparency of the sector. So it's mandated that if you are to keep your uh, tax exempt status in the US, you must make your um, all grant making information publicly available. So all the foundations and nonprofits submit this 990 to IRS internal revenue system and which are which then become uh, public good, basically publicly available information. Um, this is uh, 990s uh, more recently. It has multiple sections. This is the basic section with the name, EIN, all that information address. It has another section that has staff and financial reviews. These are basically aggregates, um, mission and programs. Then uh, here are the details information, the grants information, where you can see the amounts, the recipients, the you know purpose of the grant, and all that information, which are uh, you know really important for us to dig through to learn more about who is doing what and where. So that brings us to the sort of the primary question: why transparency matters. Um, first of all. And this is my opinion, and this is really very, you know, 
a quick summary of why I think it's important is basically uh, transparency is basically the first step towards accountability. Um, there, there can't be any accountability without transparency. And we all, I'm sure, can recognize that accountability is super important for any sector, including uh, philanthropic sector. And it also answers a bunch of other questions. Um, and that is what, you know, because of this transparency, relative transparency that we have in the US, we are able to answer all these questions like who is doing what and where, how can I scan the landscape of funding? Who would be the best funder for me? Uh, what are the nonprofits or foundations should I partner with or like what regions need help the most? So these are some of the questions that we can answer, but at the core, it addresses the foundations problem that you know Pritha talked about and Ingrid also talked about. As a donor, you know it addresses the problem that as the donor faces that it's hard to find the best use of your charitable contributions. So if there is transparency, I think it becomes much easier to uh, address this problem. And also for the nonprofits, you know they often feel fundraising is painful and inefficient, and it takes away from nonprofits working toward their mission. So at the core, I believe the transparency answers these very two important problems. And because we have, you know, if you have transparency, you can take a look at the sector and see what's happening. So let's say for the US, you know, if you if we do a comparison between 1950 and 2015, we can see that how much the sector has grown. Over, over time. So like in 1950, there was like 1,000 foundations. And in 2015, we now know there are 103,000 foundations. And also for uh, total assets, it has grown exponentially over decades. In 1950, which is, um, you know, adjusted for inflation, uh, 25 billion, that sector has grown many folds and has become, you know, is a 825 billion. Um, in terms of total assets and you can do also a bunch of other cool stuff like for example you can see how foundation giving intersects with um, the sdgs for example so this is uh, taken from sd funders you can see that how foundation contribution falls into different sdg categories for example you can see foundations are most interested in education and health sdg four and three respectively uh, and this is global, this is not for US, this is for um, across the globe based on the available uh, funding information coming from non uh, foundations. And you can also take a deeper dive. So for this case, this is a map of Mexico and you can see how foundations from across the globe, even though it's mostly uh, overwhelmingly from the from US have been funding uh, Mexico. So we know of over 54,000 foundations who have granted about $4.6 billion over the years uh, to this country. And this is possible for any country as long as the you know, data is available, the transparency is available, uh, transparency is there. Uh, so how could this look in an Indian context? Um, so you probably know that, and Ingrid also talked about uh, a little earlier that we have um, it, it, you know, in conjunction with our partner Ford Foundations and CSIP, that put together this portal, uh, Philanthropy in India, and we have gathered all the available information um, that is available uh, on India's philanthropy. So that includes grants coming from outside to India and what is available without India. We have tapped into. Uh, the databases that are available uh, due to uh, FCRA and CSR regulations. But what it lacks tremendously is uh, the contribution from Indian foundations. We have very limited knowledge of what's happening, what the Indian foundations are funding, the Indian foundations within India are funding. So like we have very, very limited information. So that's the reason we can't confidently say that this is the entire picture. So this is based on what we know, but we believe we are, you know, set up for success um, because of all these initiatives, all these conversations that we are having. And over time, it will become, 
you know, more data will become available and we'll be able to say more about the sector, more transparency will be ensured. But there is this huge opportunity and especially the COVID, the pandemic, it's, it's a wake up call for all of us to become more transparent because it, it helps us to um, make the sector so much more efficient. You, you know, there was this um, uh, session a few weeks back about Northeast, what's happening in Northeast. Uh, I know some of you reached out to me to learn what's happening and it's publicly available. You can go to the portal, which is basically philanthropyindia.candid.org and take a look at it yourself. But there's very limited data available. So let me reiterate this point one more time. This is really important for all of us to share uh, what we know about the data. Um, the reason I started with our own example in the US is because I wanted to present it as a case study that what is possible when we become transparent. Yes, there are hurdles. There could be uh, some unwanted attention from other stakeholders, but eventually it works out for the entire sector. Um, but we just need to get started. Um, so I, I think I will stop at that. And you know we can talk about um, more about this when the Q and A session begins. Over to you. Thank you, Arif. Thank you, Arif. If I can turn to you now, Pradeep. Um, you know, I, I, if I had to sort of construct a, a, a dream funder, right? I mean, I, I would be looking for someone that funds social justice, that funds at the margins, that. Uh, uh, it provides flexible funding that covers institutional costs, that is a long-term partner, that uh, helps to strengthen the ecosystem and not just, you know, funding individual organizations. Ford would probably be the first name that, that came to my mind. In fact, um, I'm actually recalling a time many, too many years ago, when an organization that I worked with is called Cry. Uh, was approaching Ford for a grant to fund what was then our first um, website. Uh, and we asked for a sum of money for uh, over a two year period. And our program officer at Ford said, you're going to need twice that much and you're going to need it for three years uh, before they sanctioned that grant. So uh, what is it, what can you as someone that represents Ford here in the region, uh, say to other funders about what are the benefits of operating the way you do? You're on mute, Pradeep. You're still on mute. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. I wasn't. Yeah, no, I said there's always and someone who's got to do that. Thank you for joining us at this ungodly hour. <laughs> No, no, that's okay. I was going to say there's always someone who's got to speak on mute, right? It's great to, um, you know, attend the session again and be with all of you, all of whom I know on this panel, which is really nice. <laughs> um, and uh, so I, I don't know where to start, Ingrid, because, you know, I mean, all of us in this panel, I think, uh, kind of know the answers to some of the questions you asked, the specific questions you asked. But, um, you know, I'm going to attempt anyway to both share some experiences and um, and um, also, I guess, uh, my own observations, building on what everyone before me, Arif and you and Preeta spoke about. And I am going to be uh, candid <laughs> here when I say this. Um, see, I think, you know, obviously it's it, it, it took us it took us a while to get here right? as a foundation. I think we've got to be honest, we've had maybe a lead on many other foundations you know we've like you said been around for seven decades and um, you know uh, i think one of the things that i've been involved in the last few years which has given me a lot of pleasure is when either new funders uh, especially in india or existing funders have come and said hey can we just sit down and look at your history and how you evolved and got here to maybe learn something from that and apply to it um, and, and not necessarily do the exact same thing because I think that would be foolish but then innovate and disrupt like you say right because I think if you look at organizations like ours and there are several others also but mostly international you would see that we all went through a journey that got us here right and each of us have landed at, you know, at a spot where we think we're the most effective 
right? So whether it's a rock, and I'm talking only about international foundations and those that I know well. So whether it's Rockefeller or Umidia or Dell or us, I think each of us have kind of found our sweet spot, right? Based on years and decades of um, experiences ourselves. Um, Indian philanthropy has, is not is not there yet, right? Is not um, and and to Preeta's point about examples of NGOs which in India are not at the level or the scale, Preeta, that you would hope they were, right? Based on your comparisons with even Bangladesh, I would say the same is true for Indian funders also, right? It's not the amount of money, right? Because I think Indian funders far, uh, you know, have much more, whether it's CSRs or whatever, than Ford or many others. But I think it takes, you know, some level of determination and introspection and a lot of other things for a foundation to kind of get to a certain level. And I'm being very honest here that I don't think we have too many Indian funders who are there yet. And that leads to some some of the challenges that we're seeing, right? I think Indian funders, to what, for whatever reasons, and I'm not saying it's a bad thing, so whatever, you know, just a reflection, like I said, on what I, you know, observed, Indian funders, for whatever reason, you know, it's, and, and this, in a way, I think is what makes the cycle go round and round. Giving in India still largely is uh, based on gut feel and personal interests. And, and I'm talking even for large organizations, right, on what I feel and what a few of us at the management think and, and, and so on and so forth. And maybe it has helped and served up to this point. But I think especially the last few years has made us realize that's not the future for Indian philanthropy. You could, it has not been in for the U.S., organizations, I mean, U.S. organizations, whether it's Rockefeller, or Ford, or many others, have nothing to do with the people whose names, you know, we uh, are based out of. And we have, you know, fiercely been independent organizations for a very long time now, right? Just like most corporates. And we're in, Indian philanthropy is not there yet, right? We don't have any, I think, large Indian philanthropies who kind of have that same kind of structure, which in turn, I think, gives you that flexibility um, and that maybe some, you know, I think, uh, I, I, I dare say freedom to do things very, very disciplinedly or to tear the phila- tear the book, like you say, and innovate, right? Because there is there is advantage to being very independent, being able to chart your own future and destiny because you can fail, you can succeed, but at least you only blame yourself and then keep doing it all over again, right? And I think we're not there yet in Indian philanthropy, and you all know this as much as I do. And what that leads to is many of the challenges and problems that uh, all of you, especially Preeta, laid out, right? So if we talk about, talk about capacity building, organizational development, all of us know it's the right thing to do. I don't think, you know, like Arif said, we're preaching to the choir. Everyone knows it's the right thing to do. We do it in every other sector. When VCs fund startups, they never tell the startups all the money needs to go only for product development. They tell them, in fact, go and you know, get the best office, hire the best people, do whatever it takes, because you've got to take care of yourselves before you focus on products. Everyone knows that's how companies grow. The sector needs does not need to be different. We're all, I mean, whether you are registered as a nonprofit and whatever you're registered as doesn't matter. I think business organizations all need to take care of themselves first before they can focus on their real work, right? And we all know that the biggest uh, I think the people who suffer the most, like you said, Preeta, are the communities that these organizations serve, right? I mean, at the end of the day, um, these NGOs, if you are not helping them uh, build on themselves, are not able to work with the communities that they, uh, uh, you know, uh, set, were set up to help in the first place. The um, But but I want to now, I mean, so I spoke about funders for a bit now. Um, I want to you know, turn to the NGOs and the organizations that actually do work on the ground. So I think the org, they also need to take some responsibility for where they are. And let's be honest, right? Because like the funders, I feel quite a few of the NGOs, Prita, maybe this also answers your question about why don't we have certain kind of NGOs? They're also mostly individually led, right? They're led by strong leaders. And again, maybe that model served well and helped up until this point, because you know, we're talking about social sector in India, even though it's the most vibrant in the world, is still not that as old as it has. It is in, let's say, the US, right? So I think 
when these when social organizations started and when they were you know when have they gone through their journey i think we're still in that place where even they haven't transitioned to a structure that is truly professional right they they're mostly led by amazing leaders which is a good thing but and i know that we all speak about this we don't know what the next um stage looks like for these organizations right and i think most of these social organizations also need to invest in themselves need to spend money on themselves to be able to convince funders that maybe they are ready for uh capacity building grants right one of the challenges that we have even though we do a lot of these um capacity building grants believe it or not is we cannot find enough um uh, or social organizations that can absorb capacity building grants right absorb i mean I, i don't mean to say that we cannot find enough organizations that do work because there are more than enough organizations but you know to absorb capacity building grants they need to be able to be able to absorb it right they need to know what they can do with it and you won't believe the number of organizations that we have supported also who comes to us at the end of the or almost towards the end of the grant term and say we're not we're not been able to spend the money can you extend it for a few years can you extend it for whatever and it keeps going on and we realize that's problem pro- probably because the organizations themselves have been thought through this process and are not structured to be able to receive capacity building grants themselves and it's not as easy as saying okay we understand this and we this is where we're going to spend the money now give us the money it's much more complicated than that right you got to go through a process and it's not they're not there yet so it's i would say for the ngos also got to take some responsibility whether it's training you know whether it's um whether it's investing in you know more people or whatever uh another area that i feel these um, you know which is confusing for us and this goes to arif's point about there is enough data but there is not enough data also on india you know uh, sadly enough and i think no one really in india cares for it as much as maybe in the us about the lack of data or data existing because like i said both from a funders perspective as as well as a social organization and ngos perspective that doesn't seem to be the primary focus at all and i think it's a reflection of both there is no demand for it and there is no supply of it and somehow i think everyone is fine and comfortable with that we need to move that that's not how philanthropy as a sector can progress in india we need data funders need to ask for more data and like i said partly it's because to my earlier point funders in you india are not structured in a way that they think that they need to rely on data but similarly i think ngos need to then um, on the ground need to focus on producing enough data that can be then sent back neither of this is happening and it's not happening and it doesn't seem to be as much of a concern for the sector here like you would think it would be right i hear like even in our associations with these grants ironically almost all these requests have been rf you know with you know when bruce initially came and said let's do this for uh, when Bra- brad sorry initially came and said let's do this for india it is ironic there is an organization that's based all the way in new york that was concerned about generating data for india we don't see enough of that happening in india um and and you know, I, i don't i don't know why why that's not happening but that's the truth another area that i think ngos uh, where i i think can step up is there's not enough collaboration that happens we talk about collaborations amongst funders right it is happening it's maybe still there is still a lot of room for improvement there um and you know we know why these collaborations are important especially and i'm talking about between funders especially with the new fcra rules and amendments you know it makes it makes um strategic sense that you know that certain uh, international funders focus on certain things and that indian funders focus on certain other things because you know you get these certain things you can and cannot do right but it's surprising that when we that's happening on one end but that at at the ngo level there isn't as much collaboration as you would like but right? especially i think when you look at it from a from a funders perspective or even from a communities perspective right let's talk about communities that all of us are hoping to help so Preeta, your example of you know whether it's a scheduled caste or tribes. Let's say we're talking about communities in Jharkhand that are really wanting help. From their perspective, also they're sometimes pretty confused that there are twenty NGOs reaching out to them saying we all want to help you. You know, with very very similar kinds according to the communities. You know, very similar kind of 
proposals of this is what we'll do for you this is what we'll do for you so forget funders i think if you if i was a community and i have like 20 or 40 different organizations come to me at different days of the week different weeks of the month and saying we'll help you i'm pretty confused on what's going on and most probably each of these ngos are in turn demanding or requesting certain <clears throat> certain protocols and process from these communities, which takes a lot of time and effort, right? Because these people who must be thinking at the end of the day, I just want to be helped. What's all this work that I've got to do, especially with 40 or 50 different NGOs. So and that is where I think, and I'm not even putting my funder hat on, I'm just talking about as a citizen of the country, it's pretty confusing. And, you know, I think one of the things that I would really personally like to see happening in the region, is given that we have so many wonderful NGOs and I realize that there is a need for those very, very different NGOs just because of the complexity that our region presents. But I still believe that collaborations amongst the social organizations can and should be happening to a much greater extent than it is today. And maybe it's time that, again, those of us working in the sector demand those kind of collaborations, right? Demand that organizations that are working on the ground speak with each other. You know, they might, you don't have to be best of friends in the way you do your work, but you have to share your work across, sitting across the table, see what is it that you can, you know, collaborate, pool your resources. And we try to do that among, within our group, at least our group of grantees and partners. We try to bring them together. We ask them to speak. And in several cases, sometimes when we even don't potentially fund um, you know, uh, make grants. We say maybe, listen, we cannot give you financial support, but one of the things we can and will provide you is we want you to come to the table. We want to introduce you to other organizations that are doing similar work, either in the geography or in the same sector. And we want you all to speak with each other, right? And I, if I were the social organization, I would see this as an opportunity and not a threat, right? Because at the end of the day, if you are given that we are all complaining about scarce resources, wouldn't you rather focus your time and energy on, on, you know, not replicating what someone else is doing and rather focus on something very, very specific, one. And secondly, if you do collaborate and you're able to solve the problem, isn't that a good thing, right? Isn't that if you're actually able to, that's what all of us want, right? All of us, I think, whether you're a funder, whether you're an intermediary, whether you're a service provider, whether you're the you know community, all of us want power to be, poverty to be fixed. All of us want injustice violence against women to end and so on and so forth. So wouldn't that be a good thing? We are saying here's a path to actually accentuate, you know, the, the solutions and get to this, get to the goalpost earlier. Wouldn't we want to do that? That's something, again, I think as far as when you say disrupt um, philanthropy, we need to, I, because I've not heard this particular aspect being spoken about as much as the way we have observed it, which is collaborations among, uh, you know, NGO and social sector itself. I got one more point, uh, and then I'll stop because I realize that, you know, we might have a, yeah, um, yeah, and I, 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 I think the last thing that I want to say is um, that um, coming back to data, um, I, you know, there is, you know, sometimes I think there's this concern that um, if you do make data available uh, even people who shouldn't be having access to that data or who could use it against against the social sector might actually benefit more from from actually so basically i guess the argument is would it maybe lead to more harm than good if we have data on who does what in india right i've heard this often and, I, you know, I, I honestly don't think so. I think more data can only help, right? Yes, short-term thinking might make you believe that, you know, make, being transparent or sharing data is bad. But I think in any cases, any specific examples or any even sector-specific sector examples, uh, and based on all of our experiences, I think we know that, forget about long-term, even mid-term, eventually sharing data is going to benefit in everyone yes initially you might feel a little challenged when data is available either about yourself or about the sector that says who does what where but i think when you put data out there it has a way of magically you know i think over a period of time and that period of time like i said may not be long term it can be mid-term 
it has a way of magically actually benefiting the society more than actually harming and even the individuals and all the actors in it like us so i just you know and this again is based on our personal experiences more than anything else of decades of being very transparent sharing data you know we share everything um, with all of our partners or with anyone who we ask anyone who asks and it has only helped us more than anything else and you know whether we're talking about governments uh, or anyone else i think that you might be concerned uh, with access to this data i think in fact disclosing and being transparent is always better than not sharing data and doing things in uh, you know in 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 privacy and isolation thank you thanks pradeep uh, i'm actually reminded of um, something i don't know how many of you know the blogger wu le out of seattle uh, who runs this blog called nonprofit af and he once used the metaphor of uh the nonprofit sector being like hunger games you know we're all at this in this battle for survival against uh be forced into this com competition to the death uh for survival by the way the sector is funded and then this of course makes it absolutely impossible uh for anyone to set aside their competitive impulses and and collaborate and he like he paints this the alternative scenario as uh star trek where you can we can all boldly go uh where no one has been before because there's you know star fleet behind you that's taking care of technology and training and data and, and all the rest of it um but thank you pradeep uh turning now to you phil um what how has covid changed philanthropic norms in the US are those changes going to stick what advice what can we here learn from how can we sort of benefit from that learning and not have to go down that learning curve here in india how can we jump uh, a few skip a few steps uh, in 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 this in in these in evolving down this path uh, in india Thanks Ingrid and um thanks for having me here. I mean, let me start off by saying um that there is so much unbelievably great and heroic work that's being done by nonprofit organizations supported by philanthropy and I think it's right and good that we're all focused on how things can be better, but I also want to root you know my comments in the reality and your really excellent recent report from CSIP Ingrid documents the ways in which nonprofits have responded amid unbelievable challenges simultaneous increase in demand and decrease in revenue and the sort of agility and adaptation and vital work that has gone on uh work that isn't being done often you know by government or business as you alluded to at the beginning so i i want to make sure we we focus on you know the good um, because there's so much of it even as we also say look there are some norms some of which i think are shifting more quickly because of covid uh to your question that i'd really like to see change and i'll, I'll just talk um about about four of them uh briefly the first norm which i think is the root of a lot of problems uh in philanthropy is the notion that uh giving is somehow analogous to investing and nonprofits should all operate like business whatever that even means uh does that mean the dry cleaner or Volkswagen or Enron or Apple uh it's a meaningless phrase um and it leads to all kinds of problems and and missteps uh similarly if you try to do your philanthropy as if you are an investor that'll lead you lead you down um some problematic paths including the search for a simplistic universal measure an analog to ROI by which i can compare the organization working on climate change to the organization working on education it's just not like that and we need to embrace the complexity and difference i'm not saying you can't learn anything across sectors but i'm saying that we need to be mindful of how uniquely challenging philanthropy is and the different context in which nonprofits operate the dynamics are collaborative rather than competitive 
And it's incredibly difficult work and we should respect and really underscore that. I always say, you know, running a nonprofit takes everything it takes to run an equivalent size business and a ton more. And we can talk more about why that is. So that's one norm I'd like to see shift. And I think it is shifting from a period of sort of 2000 to 2010 when everything was, you know, sort of being driven by the business schools and consultants who wanted you to uh, foist a corporate framework onto the philanthropic context. And I think that's that started to shift. Related norm that I'd like to see shift is that, uh, and I think is shifting, um, and I do think that the recent crisis has accelerated this, is that strategy is to be defined by the donor, that the donor or the foundation has the strategy and everybody else executes. So this sort of top-down disconnected approach where folks come up with something that seems like it makes sense in a conference room, but is totally disconnected from the people that you intend to help or the or or those who are closest to them. So I, in the in the book that you kindly mentioned, Ingrid, uh, Giving Done Right, I talk about one example um, that's illustrative of this uh, from Bill and Melinda Gates, who've done much great work in the Gates Foundation is a client of CEPs, and I think they've done a lot of great work in global health, but they've also had some stumbles, one of which was when Bill Gates said that he, he, he believed that the best way out of poverty for people in developing countries was to help them was to have them raise chickens and uh, launched into an initiative with a nonprofit called Heifer International, uh, wrote a blog post that said essentially, actually, if I were poor, that's what I would do. I would raise chickens. Um, well, some of the intended beneficiaries uh, and countries said, we don't want your chickens. Uh, and the uh, director of... Um, or the finance minister of Bolivia, which rejected the gift, said, who does he think we are? Some backward people living 500 years ago. Um, you know, uh, we, don't, we don't want this uh, philanthropy. And so it doesn't matter how much something might make sense to you um, in the abstract. We have to guard against the idea that we know best what others need and really put at the center the, the communities and the organizations closest to those communities uh, that we're trying to help. Um, a third, and I think also, again, related norm um, and um, and something that, that Preetha spoke to, you know, is, is this notion that we have to restrict and track every, every dollar, right? We want to support the food pantry that's serving the hungry, but we, we only want our money to go for the broccoli and the potatoes and the meat, not the rent for the space that's needed to serve that food, not the staff who need to coordinate the legions of volunteers who do that work. This makes no sense uh, whatsoever, right? So especially when we see organizations whose goals overlap with ours as a donor, we should fund them to be strong as organizations infrastructure and and really everybody has touched on this all the other great panelists is not waste uh we need uh strong institutions and i would i would broaden that out um to say uh we we need a strong sector and so we need to support infrastructure as as um as has been alluded to including the development of data um, that Pradeep and Arif talked about, um, and support for organizations like the Center for Social Impact and Philanthropy, which is really doing very high quality research to try to educate uh, donors. And, and we, need, we need to invest in that because all the resources for being good at philanthropy are not going to be found in the Harvard Business Review, right? We need uh, resources that are tied to this particular particular set of challenges. Um, the fourth and final norm that I'd like to see um, uh, go away uh, is essentially not learning from what has worked. So, um, you know, to be honest and, and respectfully, I don't, I don't love the notion of disruption uh, when it implies that, you know, as I think it sometimes does, that everything is broken. In fact, there is much we can learn from that has worked. 
And yet we see new donors so often coming in and saying, well, we have an entirely new approach and we're reinventing philanthropy. And I'm applying what I learned in this area or that area. And it's, and, and it's going to be magical. And it, and it never is. Uh, you always see the predictable stumbles, the need to realize, boy, this is much harder than I thought it was. And of course, the new is rarely new. Uh, it, and, and it's often the case that if we had looked back and studied what has come before us, we'd, we'd go down a better, a better path in terms of our giving. So I'd love to see more um, historical analysis, more analysis of what is working today. We actually know a lot about what does work uh, more than maybe sometimes sometimes we realize. So I think with that, I would just end where I started, which is to say, even as we search as we should to improve philanthropy, to improve the work of nonprofits, let's also just recognize, especially in this period, and, and we've um, studied yeah, you know, sort of in a way that's analogous to the report of CSIP that I mentioned before at CEP, the tremendous way in which givers stepped up, donors, institutional foundations uh, in, in 2020 and, and 2021, and the incredible adaptability of nonprofits that realized the people they served were in crisis. They needed to, to, to respond in a different way and they, so many of them really stepped up and did that. And we should learn from that as well. So I'll leave it there. And I look forward to the interactive part of the discussion. Thanks, Phil. Uh, just one follow-up question. I noticed that Center for, the Center for Effective Philanthropy recently revised its definition of effective philanthropy. Do you want to, yeah. do you want to just speak to that a little bit about why you needed to revise it and what the new definition is? Yeah. I mean, because because we'll always be revising it as we learn, right? Um, and and I think it's it's our idea about how how we might define philanthropic effectiveness. Um, folks are free to bring their own definition to the table. We don't see it as you know on some tablet, you know, coming down from on high, but rather a sort of working draft um, where we just suggest that. Um, really there are four major elements and we try you can see it's on our website cep.org we try to say what each of them really takes one is you know clarity about clarity about goals the what you're trying to do that sounds so simple but um it is often the case that we'll see um donors who will say well i want to understand my impact better and you know we'll say well what is the impact you're trying to have and and can't quite get clarity on that. Uh, if you're not clear about what, what you're hoping to do, um, not a lot else will follow. Uh, second is, is good strategy, the how. Uh, as I said, strategy in philanthropy is, is distinct and different than strategy in the business world. I, I worked as a strategy consultant in the corporate world where strategy was all about unique positioning. We wanted it to be ours alone. In this world, as I said before, if your strategy is not shared, if it is yours alone, it will fail and it should be informed by those closest to the issues and the communities that you're seeking to address. The third element is, is implementation, which is largely about, not only about, but largely about how you work with nonprofits and the various um, uh, themes we've touched on, uh, including bringing a level of trust and respect uh, to that relationship, uh, which means, I think, giving um, unrestricted support where you can when the goals of the organization overlap with the donor's goals. There are times to give restricted grants, and then you should do them, uh, as Preetha said, in a way that actually covers um, you know, the true costs. Uh, but also, there is an opportunity for, for much more giving that supports uh, organizations. And then the fourth is is, is learning and assessment, um, recognizing that there's going to be a constantly iterative nature uh, to a effective philanthropic approach as you try things with others as they work or don't work and you modify accordingly. So that's really the high level you can you can read the document and and also give feedback because 
like I said, we don't think it's perfect. Uh, it's just a working idea of what of, of how of how you might define uh, philanthropic effectiveness. Thanks, Phil. Um, coming back to the rest of you. So a lot of the questions in the Q&A box are about collaboration and why it isn't happening. Um, to any of you here or to each of you, uh, where have you seen collaboration be created or, or collaborative mechanisms be created effectively? And what has that taken? What is what is that secret sauce that makes collaborations work, if you will? Uh, I mean, one of the upsides of, of the this pandemic has actually been people's recognition uh, of the value of collaboration. Um, I, I think everyone looked at just the sheer scale of what we were dealing with and realized that nobody was going to be able to go it alone on this. Uh, and on both sides of, of the divide in India, whether it's on philanthropy or on the, the nonprofit side, uh, interesting new collaborations um, and collaborative networks have evolved. Um, so anyone, Pradeep, Prita, Arif, uh, where, what does it take to make collaboration work? What, or even what is it that, that prevents collaboration from happening? Prita, I see you want to go first. Yeah, I'm just raising my hand because I'm literally just off the collaborative track of uh, Charcha 2021. That was the previous track where we uh, spoke about, you know, what's the lessons from collaborations in the Indian social sector. But um, to cut a long story short, two points that I'd make here. One, collaborations prior to the pandemic were abysmally low, actually, in India. Uh, and when I say that, I'm, I'm saying it with a bit of a caveat, a uh, little bit like what Pradeep also alluded to, that there have been some funder-to-funder -funder collaborations, some examples, of course, of you know very strong movement building where um, you know, there have been many NGOs and community-led organizations coming together. So a lot of partnering, if I might use that term, but collaboration, I'm here being a little pedantic to say at least three or more organizations. And in India, it's typically been multi-stakeholder funders, NGO partners, sometimes even government, maybe research and other intermediary infrastructure organizations. They're coming together for a upfront shared strategy shared vision and then going through executing that to reach their goals and if i look at collaboration from that more slightly formalized structure you know when we did our collaborative study in 2019 we could barely find about 13 to 15 collaboratives in india that had tested and stayed the course uh, some of them started but then just got converted to standalone ngos because the cost of collaboration was too high but that said, in the last 18 months, we are seeing as many collaborations literally under crisis, whether it's the SWAST, uh, you know, ACT Grant Supported Alliance for Healthcare, RCRC, which is the Rural Coalition, you know, for livelihoods. We saw a lot of coalitions to support the Mumbai slums for rations, and some of those are still sticking to provide food and shelter. We saw the Migrants Resilience Collaborative come up to support uh, you know, the millions of migrant workers that were displaced across the country. So, so many examples in the last 18 months. And to me, you know, the secret sauce is really the trust. You know, is there a trust deficit or is there a trust in the bank, so to speak, across these stakeholders? Because this does require giving up of control. It does require setting aside ego and personal and individual organizational agendas. Of course, those are not subservient to, totally because each of the organizations need to have the passion and commitment to stay the course. But if any individual or organizational priority supersedes that of the collaborative, then I see that you know actually buckle under because then there are fundamental fissures that apply where you know the collaborative is unable to hold together and push collectively towards the common purpose. So really collaborators that have succeeded have done explicit formalized work on set in place mechanisms to build trust through governance that is shared, uh, through multiple strategy sessions to share, learn, course correct, uh, through communication or over communicate literally verbally through meetings, et cetera. So multiple mechanisms to build that trust and nurture it so that even if one or two organizations feel they're in the backseat, they're still energized enough to be a part of that collaborative. 
Thanks, Pritha. Anyone else? Pradeep, Phil, Arif, do you want to speak to this question of how we can make yeah. collaboration work? I mean, I can share some experiences, Please, I Pradeep. guess, like Pritha, um, of, you know, what's worked um, and what I have observed. Um, you know, I think to what, adding to what Phil said, um, you know, I think what's unique about this sector, um, one of the many unique things about this particular sector is that everyone working in the sector, I think, um, what defines the sector is that we put someone else, or something else before us, right? I mean, that's I mean, all of us here are, again, going back to what I'd said earlier, um, are, are in the sector because we really want to help communities, right? Individuals and communities um, address some social issues. So I and so, so I, I've seen that some of the collaborations that's really worked well is when that particular um, when we remind ourselves that it is about the community and it's about this particular group of people defined by whatever characteristics or features. And if we can kind of start from there and then build on everyone who's working around that particular issue or community, then automatically I think organizations kind of get drawn to that. A case in point, all the examples that Preeta used are very specific to a specific community, whether it's women, violence against women, whether it's you know the health sector. So when there was a very specific, here's the community, here's what needs to be done, and then let's build on it. I think in, in those, cases it's easier for organizations to be drawn to it and say hey wait a minute we're doing something similar we'd also like to be a part of this uh, conversation in whatever way right it doesn't need to always be money as we clearly know so i think those have been very powerful i think in helping set up collaboratives now i don't know how you take that and break it down and say well this is what it means to, if you want to do it in all the other sectors because when I, you know, but but maybe there is something to be learned there, right? That the fact that when it's very specific, again, focus in a very specific community, and then you kind of build outwards, right? Then the collaborations are easier rather than starting with organizations and saying, hey, let's find something to do together, right? I think that thing doesn't work, which maybe is some, you know, sometimes when we attempt to do that, it doesn't really work, right? And I'm saying that even as a funder, if I just say, to another foundation say hey let's just find something to do together it doesn't usually work that way right it's it's a good conversation to have with someone but it doesn't work but when it's very specific and then builds outwards i think it really works and the second thing is let's be very honest i mean you know it is resource in intensive right collaborating it's it's a it takes a lot of effort again it's not as easy as saying sign me up i'll be a part of this it requires investment of your time doing something that maybe you had not not accounted for in your responsibilities as an individual or as an organization, right? You got to share stuff. You got to prepare stuff now to share with someone else. That takes time. You got to maybe have an individual or individuals in your organization be responsible for managing this relationship and so on and so forth, right? You new things get produced, you know, manage more meetings to attend and all of that. So this is resource intensive. So I think organizations that already are complaining and rightly so that they're starving for resources, sometimes this becomes a real practical challenge for them to collaborate, even if they want to, right? And I think so we need to think of creative ways of maybe as a funder, maybe as an, you know, as an intermediary or whatever, I think we need to think about the practicality of making collaborations also happen. And, you know, we, I know as an organization have internally allocated resources and, you know, said that certain individuals or some responsibilities of existing individuals would be or should be put aside to collaborations, right? Similarly, I think we need to look at this really because I think none of us here are disputing that collaboration is a bad idea, right? Like Phil said, I think no one, we all, I think this sector, there is no competition. I like to believe there's no competition. It's all about working together. So I think since we have all accepted that, maybe it's time to also see that is, so I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that I don't, I don't think that it's a lack of intent or it's a lack of knowledge or awareness that's preventing collaborations. I think it's practicality. It's the real issue of not having resources, whether it's time or money that's preventing this. So you're just not able to dedicate time to it. So I would say that's the second thing. So again, I mean, first is to see if we can let, you know, it can be starting with the communities and lead out, um, you know, kind of build outwards. And the second is 
really sitting down and trying to see how we can address and um, you know, factor for lack of resources. Thanks, Pradeep. Phil, Arif, do you want to speak to this at all? Uh, only thing I would say, I mean, I think I, 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 I agree. Um, I think that purpose, you know, has to come first and collaboration is not an end in itself, right? Uh, but 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 often is crucial if you put purpose first. And Ann Wallisted, who runs Board Source um, in the United States, has a great or article I highly recommend in the March, uh, sometime in March, in Stanford Social Innovation Review about purpose-driven boards. And I mention it because I do think that boards play a key role here. And um, there is a different orientation board members should have when they're at a mission-driven nonprofit organization serving a board role than you would have if you were in a corporate zero-sum competitive environment. The questions that you ask are different. Um, and uh, it isn't just about the entity or the entity's reputation. It is actually about progress on the important goals. So I think we need to talk also about the board's role in sometimes defaulting to a form of governance that makes everything about the organization and loses sight uh, of, of the purpose. Yeah, just Thanks. wanted to, sorry, just wanted to quickly add to that. Yeah, so since you taught, you know, said I'm the data guy, so let me give you some context from data point of view, like what we are seeing. So we have been seeing from data standpoint that some loose uh, collaborations sometimes is driven by the funders. So by that, I mean, let me give you an example. So we have, we know about this uh, Geneva based foundation who has funded a collaboration of nonprofits in Delhi to address the horror that we have seen about the lack of oxygen. So what in this case happened is they were receiving a ton of requests for grants from India based nonprofits and they kind of, you know, facilitated that collaboration. So that is something that we haven't seen usually, but have seen now because of this as a response to this crisis. So that is something that's an example of within the sector. But what else we're seeing is like the intersector collaborations. Private sector is coming and partnering up with uh, philanthropic sector. Government is stepping in. So that is something uh, we don't usually see very often, but that's what we've been seeing, um, you know, to some extent lately. So. Those are a few trends that we've been watching. Thanks, Arif. Um, I mean, if I can just add my two cents here, um, I think one of the ingredients that's critical is to actually have an independent convening body. Uh, uh, having run Civicus, I can say that you know a lot of what holds that the glue that holds that alliance together is not necessarily shared purpose, is not necessarily you know, definitely not funder driven, but just the fact that there's an independent entity that can play the role of honest broker, where they don't have a dog in the fight and they have no, you know, they're not a competitor in any sense of the word. And so to sort of, which in a sense brings me to my next question, which is the, the, the contrast between, and the, it's not an accident that, you know, three of you, uh, Four of you, in fact, are with U.S. headquartered organizations. Um, the contrast between the development of what you might call the ecosystem uh, for philanthropy uh, and civil society in the U.S., where some might argue it's it's overdeveloped, uh, as compared to India, where we you know don't have one functioning um, association of foundations or one functioning association of NGOs. Um, what is again what is the difference what what is it that makes philanthropy in the u.s invest in organizations like candid uh organizations like the center for effective philanthropy organizations like the national council of nonprofits or independent sector or the national uh, council for responsive philanthropy what what how did that happen can you can can anyone share with us 
what it took besides McCarthyism uh, to, to, to bring foundations together to invest in these uh, vital infrastructure pillars. Phil, I'm guessing I'm going to have to go to you on this one. Well, I don't, I don't, I don't know that I have the answer. I mean, I, I think, and um, Arif could probably speak to this better than I can, but I mean, I think as a percentage of, um, say, total giving, the amount spent on infrastructure in the United States is actually quite low. Um, it, but, but the giving numbers are are very large, and obviously, the sector, you know, has been around a long time. Um, so. Well, I, I'm not disagreeing, Ingrid, at all with the premise of your question that there's a much more robust uh, infrastructure in the U.S. than there is in India. And I'm sure it's also true that there is some duplication and, you know, I don't think it's over um, capitalized. I mean, I, I think, in fact, you know, some of the organizations that you mentioned, like the National Council on Nonprofits, which does really great work, you know, has a very small budget and just a few staff, right? So there, there. So I, I guess the question to me is really how to make the case to uh, donors that this matters, um, and I think that's very difficult to do um, until there's a recognition on the part of their do of of donors, which usually comes over time, that this is distinctly challenging work, right? We won't invest in infrastructure if we think that actually giving is just like investing in everything we learned in business school or in our MBA program or in our successful uh, career as an entrepreneur translates right over and I don't need any other resources, right? Then why would I invest? So I think that's the case that that we need to make. Um, and, and that's a hard case to make to folks who are new into the world of philanthropy, with some exceptions. Some people come in with a lot of humility Many, let's be honest, do not. And if you think you don't need help, you're not going to invest in those who are providing that help. Thank you, Phil. Any other comments on what it will take to generate philanthropic interest in India in actually strengthening the ecosystem? Prita. So I actually think that we are probably at that crossroads today more than ever. Uh, a little bit, uh, you know, drawing on what Phil said, you know, what's what's the good that we should build further on? Uh, because overall, historically, the sector has never been, quote unquote, professionalized, I feel, in India. In fact, philanthropy and even the historic giving, even if it was not mandated much before, right, it was given by the big uh, Tata groups or, you know, Birla's, it was very much restricted to a certain tracks that those leaders prioritized. And there was not much spoken or written about their giving uh, historically. So this has never been in the national or even subnational spotlight as one of the contributors to social economic development. I think it was known at some level, but government was always the elephant in the room. You know, philanthropy was never discussed at, at all levels from resources staffing, et cetera. Um, and given that a lot of the giving in India has been towards very specific causes towards, you know, either building temples in their hometowns of, you know, some of the larger givers or educational institutions or health, there was never a sectoral gap-based dimension approach. And this goes a bit to uh, what, uh, you know, was mentioned by Pradeep, who, which I totally agree with. It was it's still today and definitely historically a lot more by what the heart says or what the instinct says as opposed to a combination of the head and the heart or you know using data driven insights to say you know in nutrition this is the percentage gap towards malnutrition and i have a passion for nutrition so what can i do to address that gap there is you know and that requires a different type of infrastructure for all aspects right like how do you staff it how do you measure impact how do you fundraise for it, et cetera? Whereas historically, it was more about, you know, my grandparents or, you know, my legacy was that I want to give back to education because I started poor and didn't even go to school. And today I'm, I'm bestowed with so much more money. And then I decide in certain geographies where my plants are or where my family comes from, I do good and I return to society for education. So I think that 
is turning now with more CSR, more professional institutions being set up for talent and leadership in the sector, uh, more exchange between foreign givers and domestic givers, and some basic rudimentary infrastructure starting up like data, uh, institutions like ourselves, you know, intermediaries. So I'm hoping the next decade will see this grow at a much more rapid pace than the last decade. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, to let Pradeep know actually uh, that just last week we had the first meeting of a core group to set up a new civil society association. Uh, so you'll be pleased to know that that's off, the, off and running and that we expect, I think we set ourselves a target of, I can't remember now, 2,000 organizations uh, to that's sign awesome. up in the first year. <laughs> um, but Pradeep, awesome. were you wanting to speak to this interest? Yeah, no, I was, yeah and on a light note, I was going to say, because since you compared the US, on a light note, I was going to say, if you believe Giridharas, uh, then you know you would, he, according to him, giving in US is not as as kosher as you would like to believe. And he thinks most of it is just basically because of tax benefits and selfish motives and so on and so forth. So I think just to put things in reputation, perspective. Reputation laundering. Yes. So I don't I, I think you just you just I think you just wave the red flag at Phil for mentioning <laughs> on and us. <laughs> yes. So you know, I'm not, and I'm just stating it, I'm not saying I necessarily agree with him, but I'm saying, you know, so everything I think comes with a pinch of salt. No, but honestly, I think, you know, I, I'm, I'm very optimistic about what's happening in India. And I think, you know, there's so much to be happy about as people who, you know, work in the sector. There's so many, all the right things happening. Maybe it's always been happening, but, you know, my observation has been limited for the last four years, uh, very specifically. And... I think the rate of acceleration, I mean, the acceleration at which this is, uh, changes have been happening and for a, in a good way, right? I mean, you're not, you're bringing the things that worked and you're also, um, I think, adapting to different things, adapting to the governments, adapting to so many other things. I mean, India, we know, even in the best of days, is, is a very complicated place to live and work in, right? Even in the best of days, we know that. I mean, just the diversity, and I mean that in a good way, right? And you know, uh, and and so I think you know we're we're doing it. I think in a in in a in a weird way, we're doing it in a in a way that works for India. I think many of us are impatient, and rightly so, because we all would like to see the change much sooner than it's happening, and which is why I think we're talking about pushing some of these things, bringing people together, working harder, working smarter, and all of that. But it is happening. Yes, giving is not happening, at least to you and me, giving is not happening to the extent that we would like to see. But this is where data would help. For all you know, there are people, I'm just making this up, people in Tamil Nadu may be giving and doing stuff that none of us even know about, right? Completely transforming their local societies and all of that, right? We don't really know this. And I think this is, again, where lack of data really prevents us from talking about things in a way that you know, is more structured and very transparent. I, I, I do think it needs a, a nudge here and there to move people around, ask the difficult questions, because as much as we all know and appreciate everyone who's working in this sector, there is no harm in asking some difficult questions once in a while, you know, from everyone, you know, and it doesn't, I don't think one per, there's any particular group of people or player in this who should be exempt from being asked the difficult questions, whether it's a donor, whoever it is. And, and, and I think those conversations are happening. To use Preeta's uh, example, I think there is professionalization happening in the sector. Just look at the number of universities and institutes that have come up just to train and uh, or, uh, you know, uh, uh, retrain people working in this, right? And I think that's a good thing, right? It can always, and the fact that they are always full, every batch is full. And it wasn't the case when they all started several years ago. We know that. Uh, whether it's in Ashoka and ISTM and all that. But now they're all doing well, at least as far as we are aware, which just shows there's a huge appetite for people to you know, come into the sector and do it in their own way. So these are not, uh, to Phil's point, these are not business schools. People are not going to ISP and saying after that, I'll come and work in the sector. These are specific tools and you know, um, uh, training kits that are being developed only for the sector by the sector, which is incredible, right? These are not being developed by... McKinsey or someone else coming and saying, here's what you need to do. These are being developed by people working in the sector, right? So organizations, whether it's Britspan or whoever, are all acknowledging that we need a separate set of people and 
you know resources to address this particular sector so i think calling that out separately and saying this is its own thing you know we need to look at it very differently you cannot compare it to any other sector i think it's a huge step forward for india and changes are happening of course we are all impatient that we want the change and i think rightly so there is nothing wrong in asking and you know asking more you i mean you might get you know politely reminded that maybe you shouldn't push so hard but i think there is nothing wrong we all want the right thing so it's not happening to the extent that we're seeing in us because i think us has had more resources and more time to get there we are doing it in our own way right which is working and i think the few things that are not working i think all of us are calling out and we should call out more often and i think as long as everyone realizes we're all calling it out because we want all of us want the same thing right and we just seeing it very differently and doing it very differently so pradeep you mentioned anand girdhar das and uh, his book um in india philanthropy is still seen as an unalloyed good you know nobody wants to know where was this wealth uh, acquired and and were those beans uh, kosher or not nobody uh, you know wants to know the composition of your board and does it include anyone that's not in your family uh, and nobody you know is asking you questions about why you give to whom you give or how your endowment is invested um for the two of you that are that live and work in india do you think that that indian philanthropy is starting to get around to the idea of being more open to either self reflection or critique do you see any symptoms of that at all it's a tough question to answer but you know i want to go back to what phil said i at least ford foundation and i strongly believe that there is a role that you know funders can play and there's a role that we shouldn't right and we are very clear at least i think for those of you who have worked with us we are pretty hands off right we are, you know i think most of our time is spent on trying to develop the partnership but once we get to the partnership we are very we're very clear that we are not the experts right organizations so in all the work that we have done with all of you you know we we believe and we know that you all know what you're doing and you all are the, are the experts in it the only time i think we do get involved is if there is a legal or a compliance kind of issue that we'd like to be aware of and this usually happens before we give a grant right and i say this as an example because you know there are instances just this week when you know someone called and say that listen you know this particular grantee that you know and we think the board whatever it is like something very innocuous not really not really a compliance or a red flag but one of those things which is kind of yes maybe they should have this kind of conversation now as a funder i still strongly believe that it is very sensitive we get involved in these right so to your question ingrid it's a long it's a long way to answer the question i do think in, in india we need some of that happening right i'm not saying we need it because there are horrible things happening within organizations and all that hopefully not but that doesn't mean we shouldn't have some checks and balances right because i i to some extent there are some things that anand has written about which i do agree right we do need checks and balances right because even though we say everyone has good intentions and the right intentions god forbid just one rotten apple right that comes along and spoils the entire reputation of the sector right and we are a sector that's made of glass as you know right i mean more than any other sector we're all made of the sector is made of glass and it's it takes very little to break the reputation that you, look even in this last two years the wonderful work that all of us have done you know, right especially indian organizations have done in covid god forbid one small incident is incident is all it requires to come and break all that reputation and all that work right which is why i think we do need the checks and balances but i think these checks and balances and putting things in place cannot and should not come necessarily from funders alone i think it should come maybe i mean it should definitely come from the communities but maybe given that the communities might not have the force i mean the power or the knowledge to ask this this is where to your previous point ingrid maybe you have those independent you know gov- those you were talking about structures that you need for collaboration right those independent um you said no dog in the fight kind of organizations and you know maybe that is exactly the role that these kind of i mean organizations play in the country that clearly saying that 
we don't have any vested interest in this but we think it's important that these kind of things are published and you know made you know in arif like arif said in us at least they have the 990 which kind of at least makes a lot of things transparent right in india we don't have anything equivalent and god forbid i'm not suggesting something like that but i'm saying something very different and useful for india where you do ask it could be organizations like your singret that kind of you know publish reports on an annual basis that talks about you know ratings or whatever it is of organizations on how transparent or not transparent they are and these are difficult questions but i think these are important questions to ask i don't know if organizations in india are ready for it yet but again if, if you know since the case can be made that all of this will only help all of us eventually then i don't see why they wouldn't warm up to the idea thanks pradeep in fact uh, we about to publish a report a second edition of a report on the total philanthropic capital and this year uh, one of the things we've included is a quick review of foundation websites uh, to rate them for what information they do publish. Um, and I have to tell you, the story is not good at all uh, in terms of even mo the most basic information. Um, uh, Prita, did you want to speak at all to the infrastructure question or, uh, sorry, to the question of whether philanthropy, whether you think philanthropy in India might be open to critique or uh, can I ask then the question that Felicity is asking, which is, do you, and again, this may be more relevant to the two uh, India-based people on the panel, which is, do you think the idea of the social stock exchange, um, which lists both for and not-for-profit organizations, and which is aligned to SDG uh, goals, might uh, facilitate collaboration? I think I'll probably leave the social stock exchange question to you, Ingrid, given you've probably been breathing and living it, being on the committee until a few months ago. But um, I'll pick up the earlier question on philanthropy and accountability. And I'm actually quite heartened to hear about your upcoming report on looking at uh, different philanthropies' websites. But, you know, we often hear of the need for a credit rating-like agency for NGOs, right? But you barely, if not never, hear about anything that looks at funders. So, uh, Pradeep, maybe again, Ford might be, you know, at the leading edge here to even start such a discourse, right, of whether it's a rating or some kind of reflective mechanism. And I would really throw out two ideas that I think is catching up, but not at all fast enough in India. One, a community scorecard. Like, I've been working deeply in tribal health over the last two years. And looking at practices across countries, both in the global north and south, and Africa has actually tried this model very successfully. We were speaking to Joy Fumafi, who retired from the World Health Organization, World Bank, and has spearheaded a balanced scorecard to hear back from communities whether funders, multilaterals, government are meeting their needs. And you know that's really the mirror turned on to you, right? And I think it, more funders need to institutionalize that as opposed to just looking at program evaluations, which at times touch communities, but just as one spoke in the wheel. But if you're really in service of improving social outcomes, that's, I think, critical. And the second thing that, again, we don't see enough of is our grantee surveys, or you know, now it's fashionable to not call them grantees, but NGO partners. But if they're truly partners, then do they actually have a seat at the table, the decision table? Uh, and I think that's a question that every funder in India should ask themselves. Um, but going back to where this started, you know, Anand Girzadas and winners take all, I must say that, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, we are not in that kind of a society yet in India where the demog uh, you know, democracy rubric is strong enough to provide those robust institutions that can act as, you know, other vital checks and balances. And in fact, one might argue that many of those are being eroded today as we speak. So we actually don't have the symptom of winners take all at all uh, in the country. I think we have other symptomatic issues of greater accountability. But unless you know we have those strong, trusted institutions that can take care of these interests, I think philanthropy, even if the money is only a drop in the ocean, will play a huge role in informing government models, pushing in areas where you know public services are missing, etc. So. I do think a lot of what's in the book is not, India is not yet there, 
But the accountability point, I think, is definitely something we should invite, both from, as I mentioned, communities and NGO partners. So can I can I just your, pick up on on, your on what? Because, yeah, I was just saying you've just done the first grantee perception survey for an Indian philanthropic organization. So is that a sign of of good things to come in terms of philanthropists seeking, um, yeah, more external feedback? Yeah, I think so. We've actually done a couple, and thanks to Bridgespan uh, for actually pointing folks our our way. Um, it, you know, so for folks who don't know, one of, one of the things we do is is survey um, nonprofit grant recipients of foundations and provide the opportunity for candid and comparative feedback because otherwise, as we've all sort of alluded to, right, funders are in this kind of bubble of positivity surrounded by folks who are predisposed to to tell them what they think they want to hear. And so that can be incredibly helpful. And I think I think I just want to make a point about critique. You know, critique is most helpful when it's specific. Um, a particular funder needs to work on this. A particular approach tends not to work or tends to work in these contexts. And I think that the challenge with some of Anand's uh, critiques is that they um, are just widely and wildly generalized. Um, so because the Sacklers, the family behind the opioid epidemic, um, or what, I mean, there were many other actors as well, but, uh, you know, used philanthropy to buttress their reputation does not mean that all philanthropy uh, is used that way any more than if I, you know, uh, use a car to drive too fast and get in an accident, that it means that all drivers drive too fast, right? I mean, so there's a lack of nuance in, in some of these critiques, both those coming from the left, which I think sort of, sort of idealize government uh, and say philanthropy shouldn't have to do all, any of these things because government should be able to do it all. And all we have to do is look to the United States or India or any country to recognize that government doesn't do everything well and we need a healthy sector of mission driven organizations. But the critique also comes from the right politically. You know, in the US, we have an increasing sort of effort to say, well, big philanthropy is is um, pushing a woke agenda and identity politics and shouldn't be focused on racial equity. And, and, and you know, there's there's no nuance it's nothing but just generalization. And through all this, I think what I like about this discussion that we've had is I think we're all saying, you know, giving is something we want to encourage generally. Effective giving is something we really want to encourage. There are certain things required for that giving to be more effective. Um, and we're all working in our own ways on trying to build that uh, and doing our piece. But let's not turn our back on the notion that giving is something we want to encourage. Uh, that's really important. Uh, and, and so, so th those are, those are my thoughts on, on a couple of the points that, that have been made. Can I piggyback uh, I on that? that? Yes, please. Arif. Yeah. So, uh, so going back to winners take all on on book. So, the, the main criticism, which is also very generalized, and I agree 100% with did, Phil. How did this become about <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, so real quick. So it's mostly about the deaths, right? So donors, donors advise funds. And, you know, and people like Sacklers who are using those blood money on cleansing their own name. Own name. But then again, there's this huge opportunity for India to learn from all those examples. Right. So that what's happened here, so that it doesn't happen in India. And it, I also agree 100% with Pradeep that India has to find out its own way. There has to be, you know, you cannot take this model and, you know, put 100% it in place in India. So there is all those opportunities uh, that there's, th those are present from, from all standpoint, from data standpoint, from all non other standpoint. And the, another thing that when we talk about data, that we very often talk about all this financial data, but there is this huge swath of non-financial data that which we often forget that all these lessons learned that can be shared with the sector. We can start from there. Like is the financial data is so sensitive 
in given the Indian context. So let's start from all those non-financial and then probably we can move on to those financial realms at some more ideal point of time. Thank you, Arif. So I noticed that we are five minutes from the end of this session and I'm not going to try and cover everything that we that we discussed, but I just want to perhaps end on um, a note of optimism because clearly uh, despite its, its uh, grim um, impact, the pandemic has accelerated our appetite for collaboration. It has accelerated, um, there, there's some chinks of light in terms of philanthropists seeking critique, whether it's through grantee perception surveys or the study that uh, the Azim Premji Foundation did on the pitfalls and hazards or pitfalls and opportunities of big philanthropy, which is trying to get ahead of the curve on where uh, where the critique for big philanthropy might come from. Uh, there's a new philanthropic association in the form of Accelerate Indian Philanthropy. I just mentioned a new nonprofit association. Uh, there's the social stock exchange to look forward to uh, and, and perhaps uh, see what that has to bring. Um, and I think more and most importantly, when we look at the mountain we have to collectively climb in terms of we were already lagging on, for example, our accomplishment of this SDGs. Um, but thanks to the pandemic, we now find ourselves, you know, uh, having regressed maybe a decade uh, on those goals. Um, and I think perhaps there is in that challenge, in that in the enormity of that challenge, an opportunity uh, for us to actually build the collaborative mechanisms, the infrastructure, the um, transparency norms, um, and the grant making norms that will actually uh, make those goals a reality. Uh, thank you, Pradeep, Prita, Phil, and Arif. Uh, thank you to everyone uh, who participated. Uh, thank you uh, to Nudge for hosting this amazing platform. Bye-bye. Um, Enjoy the rest of your weekend and see you at our last session of this track, which will be tomorrow, where we will discuss the how technology is disrupting philanthropy. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Ingrid. Thanks, everyone. Thank Thanks. you. Bye. Bye.